All right, so welcome back and let's uh, continue and wrap up our discussion on using uh, time automata as a special case of a transition system to model the heart. Uh, so, you know, so far we've seen what a uh, timed automaton is. It's a transition system with clocks, resets, and messages or actions. And then we define this notion of uh, what is a node automaton for our purposes, where, you know, a single node is trying to model the the switching of the states from this rest period to effective refractory and relative refractory and back to rest. And so we used that piece uh, and really understood what the guards and the actions and the messages in that transition was. And where we left our understanding was this notion that we can have a, a node automaton for the, the right atrium, uh, for the right ventricle, and then we define a new type of automaton called the path automaton, which models the conduction properties between the, the atria and the ventricles. Right, so, so before we get to that, uh, a couple of announcements. So first is that there is some reading material which has been posted, uh, well actually it was be, has been posted since the beginning of this course this semester, but now is the time to refer to it. So if you go to the course web page, and I believe under assignments, you will see a reading material, uh, which is essentially a PDF called Cardiac Pacemaker Step-by-Step. -step. Um, and what this is, it's meant to be like a very basic introduction to uh, the pacemaker algorithm. Right? We did our own um, introspection of what a pacemaker ought to do when we have to treat different symptoms. Uh, but here in this PDF is going to introduce you to uh, what a regular pacemaker does, what are different uh, kinds of pacemaker as well. So there's some um, uh, you know, jargon there that you will uh, get used to, uh, especially things that you will see in your assignment as well that we haven't necessarily covered in the lecture. So I haven't introduced you, you know, what is a DDD dual chamber pacemaker or a VVI pacemaker and things like that. Uh, so this is just a reading, there's nothing due, uh, but do skim through that PDF to get a good sense of what a pacemaker does. Um, the main thing is that assignment five uh, is uh, out today, and it's due in a week and a half from today, so not in one week. And as usual, you can grab a hard copy uh, at the end of this uh, lecture today. And this assignment is essentially, you will you know, develop and play with these models in Simulink and state flow. So time permitting, we will get to that today itself. If not, then uh, at least by Thursday this week, I will give you a complete rundown of the Simulink template which has been provided. All right, so this is where we uh, ended our discussion. So let's just have a quick recap of what we are seeing on this, uh, on this slide. So uh, what you have is a node automaton, or this is our SA node. Um, and what we spent a lot of time discussing was that not everything can be called a depolarizing message because it creates problems of instantaneous uh, activations in the atria and ventricle, uh, whereas what we would like in normal sinus rhythm is that we would want the uh, SA node to expire its rest period, and uh, this transition takes place first, so you go to ERP. When that happens, you is issue a message called activate path one, um, who is listening to activate path one? It's, it's, it is the path automaton. So the path automaton is usually idling. When it, the, it receives this depolarizing act path one message from the SA node, we will transition to our anti-grade uh, direction of our path automaton, which, tends, which denotes that the conduction is going from atria to ventricle. So how long we stay in anti-grade is based on this conduction period that you can define in a separate clock Z. And so you start counting down your anti-grade conduction delay. Once that delay ex expires, you transition back to idle because the path has done its job. And in doing so, you activate uh, uh, the ventricles by issuing a new message called activate node two. And activate node two is one of the guard conditions for our ventricle. So it will uh, sort of be the causal effect for the transition from rest to ERP. Right, so this is the anti-grade loop. Let's look at the retrograde loop because sometimes it is the ventricles that can trigger first due to irritable tissue or some disease that we would want our model to replicate. Uh, so let's see if the ventricle to atria is also consistent. So in that case, for whatever reason, let's say you know the clock expired first, usually that is not the reason. You will see later on that in this picture, the ventricle and the uh, atria are completely identical in the sense that they have the exact same guard condition, only the, the variable of the clock has changed. 
but you know there is nothing which is preventing us from modifying this guard condition to say that either your clock expires or you listen from the path automaton or there is some irritable foci right so something we can completely add but the point is that in retrograde conduction we have to go from the ventricles rest to erp so we issue act path 2 so if you are an idle and you see act path 2 you go the retrograde direction of your path automaton you don't go into anti-grade because there's a different message here so act path 2 enables this transition the delay story is still the same you exhaust your timer in retrograde location before you go back to idle and then you issue the activate node 1 which is what will cause this transition from rest to erp in the retrograde direction okay so so this is where we were and there's a lot of symmetry and things were you know things are nice but but there's still something which will cause this to break, right? So let me sort of highlight that for you, and then we can have a discussion on that. So as I've said many a times before, the only way to look at this picture is things are happening in parallel, right? So clocks are counting down sequentially in all three automatons. So X, Y, and Z will count down at the exact same time. So let's see how time progresses in our, in our picture, right? So um, for the case of simplicity, let's just stick to uh, normal sinus rhythm for now. So when time is zero at the, or at the start of our simulation, uh, the two uh, atom node automatons are in rest and the path automaton is in idle, as is denoted by the highlighted location. So if this is normal sinus rhythm, what you would expect is that the thing which triggers the very first thing happens is this guard condition is satisfied. X is less than or equal to zero, which is the equivalent of automaticity of the SA node. So when that happens, the SA node transitions to ERP. At that instant, it issues activate path one. We just went over this uh, mentally, but let's just visually see what is happening. Activate path one causes our path automaton to go from idle to anti-grade. The ventricles have nothing to do with all this so far. They're happy uh, resting and counting on their own cycles because they haven't, uh, the clock hasn't expired, nor have they received anything from the path. So you have to stay in this configuration until the next interesting event is, you know, the anti-grid clock uh, uh, exhausts. So just based on this picture, let me ask you, for normal sinus rhythm, previously we have established that the rest period of the ventricle should be more than the rest period of the atria for NSR to be the predominant simulation. But let's refine that question now. And let me pose another question to you. What is the relationship between the rest period of the atria the delay of the path automaton and the rest period of the ventricle for NSR. So what's that relationship between these three things now? In terms of what is greater or less than compared to the other. Yes. Right, so uh, another way of saying that is that the rest period of the, the ventricle, not the AV node, so that's, that's a, there's a difference. The rest period of the ventricle has to be greater in this case than the sum of the rest period of the atria plus the conduction delay. Because only then you will satisfy the condition that um, the ventricles actually trigger when you, they receive the notification or message from the path rather than their own expiration of their own clock. Everybody gets that? Okay, so let's assume that is indeed the case. Um, so then the next interesting event which will happen is the anti-grade location, we have to get out of this. The only way to get out of this is you have to fulfill this guard, Z less than or equal to zero. So we are at this location in our picture. So when that happens, we will transition to idle and issue a message called activate node two. So essentially this loop, or sorry, this a path through the anti-grade location has captured the delay between the atria and ventricles. And so let's see what happens next, right? So we issue activate node two, which is forcing my ventricles to go from rest to ERP. But is that all what is happening? What is also happening in this model is when the ventricles go from rest to ERP, they also issue a message, activate path. And since my path is in idle, it will actually pick up this message and go into retrograde at the same time. 
whereas what we would what wanted was that this depolarization wave which is beginning in the atria through the delay ends in the ventricle but it is not ending because as soon as the ventricles transition to their effective refractory they are also causing the automaton to go into retrograde everybody gets sees that so the highlighted act transitions here are occurring simultaneously in normal sinus rhythm which is not what the heart does so that's a problem right there seems to be this loop here because in going from rest to erp in the ventricles the reason for which was that we received activate node from the path we are also issuing our own activate path why are we issuing our own activate path because we do want the heart to model retrograde conduction right so so this action exists for a purpose but that is messing up the normal sinus rhythm because as we make this transition we also cause the automaton to go into retrograde so this clock will start counting down in retrograde now and if it happens to be the case that after this clock expires our sa node has gone through its loop and is back in rest uh, you know the retrograde conduction can actually go back to the sa node because we issue activate node 1 so we will go from rest to erp because we are listening to activate node 1 this condition is satisfied because it's or and again when we do that we issue our own activate path 1 so we go back into anterograde right so we we can go back and forth between a single thing which started from the sa node should end in the ventricles after the delay but in our current picture because we can do this mental simulation of how time and events will work that's not enough that's not what is happening that's not the effect uh, that we intended so just so it's super clear you know i have actually marked the transitions which occur simultaneously in our model so let's let's take a look at this first before I, you know what's going to happen next i'm going to ask you to fix it um, but what is happening is in retrograde conduction let's say the first thing that occurs is we go from rest to erp so we issue activate path 2 which causes my path automaton to go from idle to retrograde so one and one occur together because of this message that we are listening to when we are in retrograde the clock expires and i issue activate node 1 to go back to idle who is listening to activate node 1 the sa node or the atria so we are listening to activate node 1 right here in our guard condition so we take the transition to our erp which is happening simultaneously with this 2 and 2 so this transition and this transition occur at the same time but when we when we issue this message we go back to idle and when we go to erp in the sa node we are also issuing activate path 1 and if we are in idle we are listening to activate path 1 so we will go back to anterograde so something which started from the retrograde side is now leading to anterograde whereas it should have just ended here so what can we do to fix this and let me give you some bread crumbs again to guide your thinking what how can we modify the path automaton to fix this yes so the proposal is we can add potentially another state yes it's along the right direction what would that state do and how would it solve this problem okay so so that's a good suggestion and along the lines of you know what's a good way to um to solve this so let me show you one idea so the problem is that these three actions going from retrograde to idle going from rest to erp and going back from idle to anterograde are being triggered simultaneously because you know there is nothing which prevents me not listening to this act path 1 when this transition is made so what i would want to do is when i go from retrograde to idle and when this act path 1 is issued i should not be in idle because if i'm not in idle then i won't go to anterograde so i want to decouple this transition from my 
message which is listening uh, to this act pat one. So here's one idea. I introduce a state called wait. And the logic is that in my wait state, I'm only waiting for one unit of time. The clock is being set to z equals one. So let's see, let's again simulate what is happening in this picture. So uh, it seems like we want to study retrograde uh, loop first. So in retrograde, this is the first thing that will occur, the, the highlighted transition. It could occur because, again, some property of the ventricle is messed up due to disease or whatever. We don't care the cause. The first thing that occurs is the ventricles go from rest to ERP. And in doing so, they issue activate path two. When they issue activate path two, at that time, we would have been in the idle. The path automaton would have been in the idle state. So it would make its usual business as usual transition to retrograde location with the exact same conduction delay. The delay expires, but instead of, the, the, when the delay expires, we issue activate node one, which is the role of the path automaton to propagate this depolarization after some delay. So we are still issuing activate node one, but we are not going back to idle. For one unit of time, I'm going to wait. So look what happens. When I issue activate node one, I transition to wait. Who is listening to activate node one? It's the atrial node or the SA node. So this transition will take place because activate node one is true. When that happens, it will again issue activate path, but we are no longer in idle. We will not respond to that message because for that one unit of time, we'll be in wait. So when this activate path is issued, my path automaton is indifferent. And after you transition to ERP, the very next stage, we are idle, okay? So that will resolve or break this parallelism which was happening between the path, the atria, and the path. We have broken that by introducing this artificial state. And it is only consuming one millisecond or one unit of time. Right? I haven't yet defined whether time is seconds or milliseconds. And so no surprises that for symmetry, we would also want to do this on the other side. So to convince you again, in normal sinus rhythm, we take this transition because our clock expired in the SA node. Activate path one takes us to anti-grade conduction. We consume our timing cycles. We propagate that conduction by issuing a message, activate node two, which causes the ventricles to go into ERP. They issue their own message, activate path, but we would be in wait. We would not respond to that. So we wouldn't go into retrograde, which we were doing earlier. So questions on, you know, if you are convinced this is the way to break this loop. And once again, you know, I've just shown how in the previous case we had three things which were happening on say the second transition. Now there are only two and three. They're decoupled because of the introduction of this new state, which is called weight. Right? We've had to do we had to use this to ensure that whether it is anti-grade or retrograde, once the depolarization wave starts, it actually dies down, right? There's, there's no continuous back and forth. Good? All right, great. So one final piece that we want to also introduce in this basic heart model is the following. So this picture is great. It can do both anti-grade uh, uh, you know, depolarization and retrograde depolarization. Uh, and by playing with the properties of the rest period, ERP, and all these timers, we can tune it to a specific, you know, bradycardia or whatnot. There's one more phenomena which occurs in the heart that I haven't yet uh, talked much about that we would want to incorporate in our heart model. And so let me set that up first. So let's say we are in normal sinus rhythm and we have taken this uh, first transition to ERP. So we would be in anti-grade, okay? Now, while the clock is counting down, so far, I sort of have emphasized that if you are in anti-grade conduction or in this location, the only way out of this location is you have to sort of remain in this until your, once you enter anti-grade, the only way you are getting out is when your clock expires. There's nothing else which can cause a transition out of anti-grade. So it almost, I'm implying almost that anti-grade is behaving a lot like ERP where once you enter, the only way you get out is your timer expires. There's no interruption whatsoever. 
But in the real heart, the path doesn't behave like that. So one phenomena that I haven't discussed but is uh, uh, relevant is due to, again, problems with the ventricle, right? The pacemaker's uh, whole purpose of existence is to fix problems, and um, I'm, I don't make up the problems so that we can get interesting timed automatas. It's the other way around. We make automatas to replicate problems. So, so one problem that we see is that sometimes there, uh, you know, I have said this before, that there's like, there could be a premature ventricular contraction or complex. PVC is the heart condition. Uh, it can occur because there may be a healthy uh, heart tissue which is surrounded by some um, damaged tissue. So the wave of depolarization doesn't reach the healthy tissue directly, but at some arbitrary time later, when it reaches the healthy tissue, it can prematurely lead to its own local depolarization. So how does that domain knowledge translate into this automaton? What I want us to think about is that if we are in anti-grade conduction and for some reason the ventricles depolarize, so the issue act path two while you are in anti-grade. So the propagation is coming from atria, but the ventricles in between have depolarized. Our model doesn't handle that situation, right? So because in anti-grade conduction, we will ignore this activate path two. We are not listening to it during the conduction. Whereas what ha happens in the, in the real heart is, you can think of as there are two simultaneous propagations happening, one from the atria and one from the ventricle, and they just cancel each other out. And the heart will actually skip a beat or maybe even two beats. So this is a real phenomena where you can think that there's a wave of depolarization from the ventricles to atria, which interferes or, or you know, there's a, uh, a, a distra sort of a, they don't add on, they, they uh, uh, differentiate with each other and they interfere uh, and they cause the heart to skip a beat. So there is no propagation that should occur in that case, right? So neither ones win over the others. Correct. It's the, it's the latter. We haven't yet discussed what model checking is, right? So in fact, the next thing we will do is introduce how you do model checking with timed automaton. Um, what, what I'm trying to show here is we begin with the simplest basal state of normal sinus rhythm, and certain configuration of our model accomplishes that simulation. But in the real heart, we have retrograde conduction, so we have to adjust our model. Right? Then we have some premature ventricular complex, so we have to adjust our model. So right now we want to get to some state where we can cover m most known heart conditions or limitations. And one of those physical phenomena is that simultaneous propagations in different directions should cancel each other out. And that is not happening in that path automaton because when you are in the conduction stage, which means you are in the anti-grade location right here, uh, you don't listen to or acknowledge anything happening in the ventricles. Likewise, when you are in retrograde, you don't acknowledge anything happening in the atria. And so to fix that, we do something similar that we did to resolve our loop. So just like we had a temporary wait state, I introduced another one final state called double, or you can call it simultaneous, whatever name you prefer. And the only thing which happens here is that if you are in anti-grade and for some reason the ventricles triggered, which is denoted by this act path two, you would go to this location double for one unit of time and then just go back to idle eventually. So you don't propagate any act node two messages. So let me give you some time to, to really look at this slide and figure out you know, how this is solving simultaneous propagation. In fact, let's do this simulation mentally. And for, again, you know, we will do it time and again so that you get sick and tired of me saying the same thing, but once I, you know, that's the whole point, and I've said this many times. So we are in, re we are in rest, we go to ERP, we issue activate path one in normal sinus rhythm. When that happens, you should be in idle, so when you listen to activate path one here, you go into anti-grade where you set a conduction clock. Idly, 
we would let this clock expire and let the message of this depolarization go to the ventricles when we issue activate node 2, when our clock expires. But this special modeling property we want is that if this clock is still not expired, which means you are conducting, and you hear some message from the ventricles that you know they have depolarized due to some disease or whatever, then they are issuing activate path 2 as the token or the message which denotes that you know they have depolarized. So if you are in anti-grade, you should handle this message somehow, which was not happening previously. And we have introduced this dummy state called double, which denotes double propagation, that if you are in anti-grade and you listen to activate path 2, we use the same trick. Let me just go to one state for one unit of time and then go back to idle eventually. So notice that how in this path from idle to anti-grade to double to wait back to idle, we are not triggering the ventricles. And likewise, the mirror image of that. If the story were to flip and we had to cancel a retrograde delay, which is being simultaneously, uh, you know, uh, has a collision with the anti-grade propagation, we would just cancel each other out by visiting the double state for a single unit of time. So, so convince yourself that this solves this problem of simultaneous propagation while preserving all the other functionality that we have try to uh, model in this time datometer. So, if there are any questions on this, this is a great time to ask. No questions? All right, okay. So we can proceed. This is the same thing that I said. I didn't realize I had a slide which uh, shows this. So what do we have so far? Okay, we have a node automaton, and uh, we are using that node automaton architecture or a template, you can say, to simulate uh, what the SA node does or the atria does. Using the same template, we can simulate what the ventricle does. The only difference is what these parameters of the template are going to look like. And then we had to design a different kind of automaton to simulate the path or the properties of the conduction path so that it can support many, many things. It can support anti-grade conduction. It can support retrograde conduction. Uh, it can not have any loops and that it can also support the canceling of simultaneous propagations. All of this is accomplished with our timed automatons. And the reason why we also wanted to, to stick with all this automatons is because of what we are going to do next, which is model checking, right? That's why uh, I said that one of the principles is you want to stick to the same formalism as much as possible, whenever possible. So just so that, you know, um, I know that you are on board, can someone remind me what message does the SA node listen to? What is the name of that message? What is it listening to uh, in all its transitioning? Activate node, exactly, right? So no, SA node we are denoting as node one and the ventricle as node two. So it's listening to activate node. Whoever issue is, we'll see who is issuing this message, but that's what's happening. And what is it issuing? Act path one. And the same logic, the ventricles listen to activate node two and issue activate path two. And so what does the path automaton do? It listens for activation of the path and issues the activation of the nodes. So you have these blocks, literally these Lego blocks, that have interfaces that are compatible with each other. So if you just connect the correct signals with the correct inputs, you have a heart model. You have an automaton which can simulate the atria, the path, and the ventricles. Okay? And the reason why I chose to depict this in this form is this is exactly how it's coded in Simulink. In Simulink, you will have blocks which implement each of these automatons, and you will put them together to replicate some heart condition, and that's all of Worksheet 5. 
I am already giving you the blocks. You don't have to build your own transition systems. But you need to understand how to connect them and how to adjust their definitions of rest period and ERPs to replicate some condition of the real heart. That's really what Worksheet 5 is about. OK? So um, just in every module, I try to tell you, you know, you have to be present in the real world as well. So in the first module, I showed you a picture of me with chillers and whatnot, HVAC systems. Um, by the way, before we get to that, um, this my, my terminology for this is NPN, node path node. You may have heard of NPN as a transistor, <laughs> you know, so don't confuse this with those NPN. So this is just a terminology to say that our model of the heart is one, uh, one node connected with another node using a path. We are free to place as many nodes as possible wherever possible to you know, um, model a condition that may not be enough to cap be captured with this sing uh, simple setup. Right, so, so you can have more nodes. So right now, if you think about a simple NPN, the path is, you know, we are embedding this conduction delay into the path. But once again, the conduction delay is actually a property of both the paths, which are these, you know, interconnected internodal tracks, plus the AV node itself, right? The AV tissue has its own sort of properties as well. So, so maybe, you know, one example is that we need a node path, node path, node to model what is shown here, right? So if we wanted to model and a more richer system, which would potentially enable us to um, debug or reproduce some hard condition that is not possible to, uh, you know, isolate from a simple NPN configuration. We can introduce a node followed by a path, followed by another AV node, followed by a path, followed by a ventricle. Maybe we are interested in some disease of the AV node, for instance, and how it disrupts normal sinus rhythm. This would be the model to use. And so you can keep going. You can be as uh, you know, high fidelity as you want. And so this concept, we have seen it many, many times of abstraction or model abstraction. The dual of abstraction is called refinement. So what does that mean? It means that NPN model is too abstract to replicate maybe some specific condition. So we have to refine our model by adding more locations and more paths to replicate exactly what we want um, in order to interface with a real pacemaker, right? That's, that's our end goal. Can this heart model produce the A sense and V sense that can interface with the pacemaker? Uh, and so we can, you know, replicate any property of the heart. So uh, let's go back to one that we've already discussed that sometimes, you know, there's some irritable tissue, which for some reason of its own can lead to a premature ventricular complex or it can, you know, depolarize uh, on its own uh, independently of what's going on in the other parts of the heart. So you, what you would do is you would, in your time automata, you will have, say, a node for each of these, so three nodes, another node for the irritable foci, and then all paths connecting them with the corresponding signals. And so what you could do is, here's one idea, that you know, in, in, in general, your activate node message, which is issued by the path, is just, you know, the path decides I want to issue it based on some internal state transitions, and that triggers the node. But you can also think of like, if you have an irritable tissue or an irritable focus is what it's called, you can have an OR gate in your model, which says that activate the node either when you listen to the path or if the irritable focus has depolarized, right? So you can do logical operations on signals to, in combination with this NPN architecture to have a very rich model of how the heart works. Uh, in fact, you know, one of the questions in the homework is doing exactly this, right? So you have to add an OR gate in your Simulink model. So I've shown you the solution already, but let's see if you can actually get the timing and everything right to, uh, to replicate a PVC in Simulink. So I've already covered this, that, you know, we may want to study the diseases or properties of the AV node in particular. So uh, a NPN model will not be enough. You have to have another node automaton that looks at what the AV node does. Yeah, this is the picture I'm talking about. I have to be in the real world, so. <laughs> okay. All right, so we have our heart model. 
And in a very short time, uh, we also want to look at, well, if we had a model for the pacemaker, we haven't studied that, which is why I issued a reading exercise. You know, we have some high-level idea that pacemaker has all these uh, LRI, AVI, PVA, RP, uh, all these should ring a bell. He had a lecture on those. They ha it has all these timers, and it's just like, a, you know, it's, it's, another, it's another automaton because it's keeping track of time, but figuring out when to pace, when not to pace. So, so that the, the PDF will give you a very high level, but a good view of what that is. But for our purposes of our discussion, let's just assume there's another automaton, which is the pacemaker, right? So some company, medical company, or an implantable cardiac device company comes to me, and they give me a Simulink model of their pacemaker. And you know, for IP protection reasons, I don't have access to what is inside. I just have a block which I can interface to. So I would connect my A sense and V sense to the outputs of my node, right? Because my node is, this, this trigger is also telling me that my node has depolarized. So my A sense would be connected to the output of the node. And my V sense is going to be connected to the output of my ventricle. It can pace uh, both the atria and the ventricle. So pacing is the same as activation. So you would have another OR gate, which would say either you activate the node because the path is doing its job, or you activate because the pacing signal was re received. But the point is you can think of given a pacemaker in the same language, the same formalism as a heart, we can compose a system which has both the heart and the pacemaker together. And it is this system that we will do model checking over. We would want to answer questions that does this complete system of a pacemaker and the heart model satisfy some condition? Is it always the case that no matter what parameters I choose in my heart model, my pacemaker will never lead to a heart rate below the lower rate interval? A guarantee for all possible cases. Right? So, so in, in order to do that, we will have Studied, we have to study transition systems, which we already have. So transition systems are just timed automatons. We will make a transition to study how do we actually define formal requirements. What does it mean for me to say, can I just say in English that don't, ca don't cause bradycardia? Is that a good enough specification for me to actually design my heart model? Or should I reduce this English language requirement of do not cause bradycardia into a requirements over here's what I don't want to happen in terms of timings of my pacemaker or the signals of my pacemaker and the heart. So to express those requirements formally, we will learn a new language called linear temporal logic. That's the language used to specify a formal notation. And given a transition system and a LTL or a linear temporal logic requirement, we will learn a tool called model checking that will automatically result in an answer. And if it is you know, not the case, if it is there is some combination of our timers which leads to um, a situation where the pacemaker cannot maintain lower rate interval, the model checker will produce that counter example for us automatically. So you will really appreciate the effort we've put into studying time automata plus LTL when we go to model checking, but only one thing at a time. So I want to use, since we have some time left today, I want to actually use this time to uh, give you a rundown of what has to be done for the next worksheet. And this also serves as a, a semi-tutorial. I don't know if we can cover all of it today. If not, we'll continue uh, next week. But I want to give you like a tutorial on the state flow stuff as well, how the heart model is actually organized in Simulink. So let's switch to that. Uh, so this worksheet, I would recommend get started as early as possible. You have quite a few um, situations to replicate. Um, I won't go into all of the text. This is just telling you how things are organized. Uh, one very important uh, thing to remember, and again, this is uh, all stated very clearly, is the way we will evaluate each of your heart models, and you have to submit many, many heart models, I think five or six of them, uh, each of them have to have something called a scope, which is an object in Simulink. It's like a virtual oscilloscope where you can uh, look at signals of your automaton. 
Uh, if your model doesn't have any scopes, we will not grade it, right? So it's just uh, to make a uniform grading process, it's a requirement that every model has a scope, and using the scope, we can see if their model is correct or not. Um, the other use, uh, important thing is that each of these problems, so you have five or six problems, um, underneath the description, there is something called a solution name. This needs to be the name of your Simulink model when you submit it. Okay, you have, so when you are submitting, let's say, the response to the first uh, exercise in which you have to stack these NPN models to replicate normal sinus rhythm, the name of that file has to be NPN anti-grade only. If it's something else, too bad, okay? Uh, and so same, similarly for each one of them, there's a recommended name. So please follow convention uh, in order to reduce any discrepancy in grading. Um, so like with most of the worksheets, if you haven't noticed so far, you know, it's a mix of tutorials slash worksheets. So go through all of this. It's very self-explanatory. But let me give you a little bit of the lay of the land in terms of the template code. So the code which is provided has two files. I apologize if this is too small. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how to zoom in here. But there are two files. One is called a model library, and another is like an example model. So the first thing you should do is open the model library. So yeah, we have to just wait in real time for. <laughs> the model library, while this takes its own sweet time, this is where I have provided Simulink blocks that you need to copy paste to generate the solutions or Simulink models for uh, each of the problem statements. So if uh, MATLAB cooperates, we can, we can see the model library. Yeah, it's starting Simulink now, so I'll just give it. It shouldn't take this long, but I think this machine is slow. Well, while it takes the time, maybe I can actually scroll through the problems itself. So the first problem you have to submit is, given the model library elements, you have to connect them so that you can replicate normal sinus rhythm. So uh, you know, if you read it, you will tell you that we need 60 beats per minute. This is the delay that we need between the nodes. So you know, these are some cues as to how do you uh, uh, initialize the timers of the nodes and the path. Uh, and then you have to connect a, a scope in which you can actually visualize that the atria triggers every uh, every second because that's equal to 60 beats per minute. In fact, for the very first problem, I've also told you exactly which blocks to use from the library in order to uh, generate NSR. So it looks like, okay, it is opening and while this is opening, I'll also open this in the background because this will take time as well. So this is our model library. Mm. OK, I think the fact that I opened this now is going to consume more time cycle. So let's go back. Um, so for the first one, we give you a very detailed view of which nodes to connect. Then the subsequent ones are not as detailed. So you know the second one is now adjust the timing properties of your previous model so that you can replicate bradycardia with some specification. I want bradycardia at 30 beats per minute. All right, so uh, hopefully you all recall what bradycardia is. So that, will be, uh, that would be its own file name. Similarly, you have to replicate tachycardia. So these are all conditions. For conditions you haven't seen before, I'll tell you what the condition is. But think of each of these exercises as, here is what I want the output of the model to look like. And you have to play with the, the, uh, the nodes, introduce more nodes, or NPN, or you know, whatever configuration you seem uh, fits best, and replicate that behavior. So let's go back. So this is my model library. This is what is provided. 
And in this library, you see some templates for nodes, like these two are nodes. Uh, there's templates for paths. There's a different template for AV node, but it is also similar to its input output like any other node. Also provided are some templates for actually pacemakers, which we haven't covered, but I'll tell you how you use them. You don't have to actually know how the pacemaker works in order to just connect it to the inputs and outputs. But what are these models? So each of these models is a Simulink block. And if you aren't familiar with Simulink, the interface is that each of these blocks has an input and an output, which is a signal. Signal is a specific Simulink entity. So in each of these models, like the node model looks something like this. So here is where I define the signal. Uh, these are just some constant blocks. In Simulink, you know, if you go to the Simulink library, um, I should think twice before clicking on <laughs> anything because <laughs> this computer is quite slow. Um, so when you open the Simulink library, you know, if you haven't used Simulink at all or it's been a while, uh, I did encourage you to follow those tutorials. But the point is that uh, it has a lot of these objects, which are logical gates or, or even this object right here. Anyone knows what this Z inverse is in Simulink? Just out of curiosity. It's just a delay. It's a unit delay. That's what Z inverse. So this is what the library looks like. So you know you have commonly used blocks, which are literally drag and drop. And so, I, OK, this worked fine. So this is a constant block. And that's exactly what is being used to declare the initial values of the rest period and the ERP period. Right? This is how you connect it to this. So you might be asking, well, where is the automaton? It's inside this object. Right? So um, let me show you just a glimpse of it first, and then I'll walk you through it a little bit later. I want to show you other stuff too. Um, so this is what the automaton looks like. So uh, at first glance, you may be uh, a little bit surprised, alarmed, puzzled, you choose your favorite adjective. This doesn't look anything that what we've been drawing on the PowerPoint slides. First of all, this looks like it has four locations, right? Where did this fourth location come from? We were used to this REST, ERP, and RRP. Um, so I'll walk you through why the reason exists for this fourth location. But let me first give you uh, confidence that this is exactly what was on the PowerPoint slide. Right? This is just a, a different way of implementing the same thing. This tool, by the way, is what is called state flow. Right? So Simulink has this tool called state flow in which you, know, you can actually create locations or states and transitions, and you can look at guard functions, all the similar things that we are used to. Uh, but there's a small caveat that we'll, uh, we'll talk about a bit later. So you know, each of these has its own. So let's look at a, a path automaton as well. A path automaton has its activate path interfaces, it has a conduction delay that you get to initialize as a constant, and it issues activate node. Very consistent with the image that we just saw. Uh, and again, to confuse you further, this, this looks much more similar to sort of what existed on the slide, but this is our path automaton in state flow. So how do you use this? Right? Let's actually talk a little bit about that since we have um, uh, some time. So this is the model library, and the other file is an example of a node path node automaton with something called a VVI. VVI is a kind of a pacemaker. So let's look at that. So this is a node path node automaton, which is also connected to a pacemaker. And don't worry about what's going on in a pacemaker. So the thing I was talking about earlier is, before I get to actually walk you through each of these nodes, um, you need a scope which is a simulink commonly used object in your model for us to grade it. If this is missing, then too bad, OK? And so the way to use the scope is also, it will look something like this. So when you open a model with the scope, this is like a virtual oscilloscope. In fact, I would really encourage you to actually even label the things, the signals into your scope so that they are more descriptive rather than these arbitrary lines. So, so let's trace these signals. Right? Let's look at this signal. This signal is output of our SA node, so what's a good name for the signal? Can, you, can someone recommend me the physiologically correct name for the signal from the point of view of, say, the pacemaker? What is the signal called, which is the output of the SA node? A sense, right? Atrial sense. Similarly, let's look at the output of the ventricle node, so this signal. Oops. 
we should call. Oh, I'm not creating a session. <laughs> Can't believe this. It's stuck. Okay, let's try that again. So you would name these appropriately. This first signal, by the way, is actually the out output of the pacemaker. So I could label it pace, but I'm not going to risk the Simulink again hanging. So let's actually run it and see what happens. And that will take some time because this, this machine is again slow. Um, yeah. Okay, so it is trying to run, and you can actually potentially read about Right, so the first time you run it, it's going to take a little bit of time because this is the first time it's uh, trying to do the simulation, but it's now updating and compiling stuff, refreshing, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, maybe next time I'll just bring my own machine and connect it to the display because this is very slow. It will not take this much time on a regular PC. This model is not that computationally heavy. Okay, so it's going through the motions to simulate this, but finally it's initializing the model. Okay, it's running and done. So, so the this is how we view the output of the uh, of the simulation in this virtual oscilloscope. So look how I named that channel ASense. So this is my atrial signal, and this is my ventricle signal. If I go back to this model for a second, it is running for 10,000 steps, and each step is one millisecond. So we are running a 10-second simulation for our NPN um, node path node automaton. Uh, and so in, in the scope itself, there's a lot of things that you are you can do, for example, you know, these one and two are virtual scope leads, so I can move them around. So if I keep, say, one uh, virtual scope reference at my atria, and then I can uh, move the other reference to the, to the ventricle, I can then look at the delta T between both of them, which is like 100 milliseconds delay, right, right here, where the mouse cursor is. So this is something that you can use to verify that what you are submitting is correct or not, because the specification of what is correct is in, in the worksheet. So even before you submit, you can convince yourself if I'm going to get full grade for this or not, because the scope allows you to do that. In fact, that's exactly how we will check your assignments, which is why the scope is the way to interface with your models. Okay, so let's actually quickly look at one of these models, and I will take the time to maybe walk you through uh, some attributes of state flow, and then uh, we'll probably end up continuing this on the, in the next lecture. So let's look at the, the node automaton. Right, so the node automaton, first of all, has the same interface that you, it can accept an activate node signal from pacemaker slash path, and it can produce an activate path signal. And the constants tell us the values of the rest periods. But let's actually get into the, into the details of how this is working. Right? So two things stand out. First, like I said, there exists to be this new state called temp, which we haven't discussed. And secondly, the states themselves look weird, right? So in the PowerPoint, there was this clock. Let's say there's a clock called rest current. And this clock is supposed to count down within the state. So where is that happening is not even visible in the state flow. By the way, when I try to move stuff around, this is something that you will also see in your, uh, in your model. Because you know these models were developed on my machine and packaged into a library. So Moving is moving one of these arrows or states around is considered as an editing, uh, you know, input by state flow. So it will give you this error that you cannot modify this object because it's present in the library. So just unlock this. Don't worry about this warning. But I know this will appear, and you know, probably will end up uh, talking about this on Piazza. So that's why I just showed you that. So now I can move this around and. Nobody is complaining, okay? So let's look at what's happening in our node automaton. We have a clock, which we call rest current. It's defined as the rest default. This should be familiar. 
Even this dangling arrow is familiar because this is our initial state. So when we are in the rest period, what were we tasked to do? The node automaton wants to count down this clock while in rest. And the way that's implemented is through a self loop. So there's a self transition which says that as long as, by the way, when you click on a transition, the corresponding guard and action gets highlighted in state flow. That's a very good interface. So this says as long as nobody has told me to activate or activate node is false and my timer, which is current rest current period is greater than zero. This is how you read this line. As long as the activation is false and my timer is greater than zero, which it would be because it's been set to some positive value, the action is rest current is rest current minus one. So this property of the clock counting down has been implemented as a guard and a action rather than a statement within the location. But it has the same effect, right? So let's say the rest period was 1,000 milliseconds. This loop will occur 1,000 times if this is the SA node because you know the activate node would be false. Is it clear? Then recall what were the two possible transitions that you could take or what were the two conditions, guard conditions that had to be true for you to transition from rest to ERP. First was that your clock expired. And the second was you issue you hear a message from, let's say, the path in this case, which says activate node is true. Those were the two conditions, and it was an or. So once again, for simplicity and for you know, being modular, both of those conditions are implemented as two separate transitions. right? So, but I want to convince you that their effect is the same. So let's look at the first transition. This transition says that you can go out of rest as long as there is no external act node. So act node is false. and the rest current has expired, right? So we are talking about this timer, it is less than zero, which is the same as saying your clock has expired. So all I have done is really, there were three things we needed to count down when we were in a location, and there was an or condition on the guard. Each of those has been implemented as its own transition. So let's complete this transition first. If there is no activation and the rest timer has expired, you issue an activate path message, exactly what we have been looking at. You issue activate path message. We'll talk about what this uptime is, which is this new thing, and you set your ERP timer to ERP default. So everything is consistent. Let's look at the second transition. The second transition out of rest is, we don't care about the clock. If you receive an activate node message from the path or the pacemaker, then you do the same action as if you were transitioning when your clock expired. So let me first ask whether it is clear that even though you know there's one location which is empty and there are three transitions out of it, it's effectively the same block, the same rest block that we had in PowerPoint. Is everybody convinced? Because if you're not convinced, then let me give you another shot at convincing you. Is it clear? Yes? There is. You can, you can implement logical ORs as well, but there is a reason for this, and I'll come to that later. But the question right now is not whether this is the most efficient implementation, but the, is the equivalent implementation of what you have seen. Everybody with me? OK. So final maybe discussion for today, what the hell is going on with this new state, right? So, so let me walk you through what is happening. Before I explain state flow, let me actually tell you the motivation for this new location. What does it mean to issue a message? Let's start there. Okay, I issue a message, activate path or activate node or whatever. What does this mean to issue a message? And in model checking, this is something that will come up very, very often where you have to be very careful about what words mean, right? That's, what, that's why you need formal notations because let me distill my own statement. What does the word issue mean? I know we are getting into like syntax and grammar at this point, or vocabulary. 
issue means there has to be a start of a message issue and an end of a message issue. When we, when we discuss this transition in the PowerPoint view of the, the, you know, the uh, mathematical view of the timed automaton, we just said that this is going to issue a message activate path. Does that mean that message persists for infinity once it's issued or there's a period when it is issued and someone is listening to it? It's the latter. So that's where this temporary state comes in. So let me walk you through what's happening. Let's say either of these were the reason for us to transition to ERP. What we would want is we want to go from REST to ERP, and in doing so, we want to issue a message called activate path for our path automaton. So what we do is, we've seen this trick before. It's the same trick as the wait and the double. You have to consume a clock cycle is the trick. So regardless of the reason for this transition, we look at, we set a new clock called uptime, a timer, to zero. And when we issue this message, right, so when we say act path is equal to true, it will remain true for one unit of time. So for one unit of time, you enter this temporary state, and what are you doing in the temporary state? There is a self loop on looking at whether the temporary state is less than one or not. So for one duration of the clock cycle, you visit the temporary state in which you actually count up from uptime equals uptime plus one. Uptime, remember, is zero in both of these transitions here and here. So you will only remain here for one. You will use, you will account for that single millisecond or clock cycle to update your ERP because technically we have to be in ERP when we exit the rest period. So even though we are in a temporary location, we are decreasing our ERP timer, as we should. And then when you transition out of the temporary location, you set your signal to false. This is the whole reason why we needed to consume that clock cycle, which is not something that we looked at you know, in our mathematical view or the PowerPoint view. So simply put, if I have to even go back and launch the scope, and let me zoom into the signal. Look how the signal consumes some cycles. So you can think of it as the flag is being set up, and for the duration of uptime, it remains one before it is set to zero, because that is what is meant to be an event. And we sort of hand-waved over this because it wasn't the object of interest when we wanted to understand transition systems, but when we implement it, it matters. If I didn't do this, then what would happen is I would set activate path to be equal to true here, and then either set it false somewhere in the ERP or you know have to account for it someplace else. So we use the same trick as before. That's why we visit a temporary state for just one cycle. Then we go into ERP. In ERP, we remain in ERP if un uh, we, we consume clock cycles in ERP, and notice there's another transition uh, self loop here which says that when you are in ERP, if you receive an activate node, you don't transition out of ERP. You remain in ERP. This is another thing that we are explicitly encoding in our implementation. Why do we need this is again because this node, don't lose sight of this picture, this node responds to activate node messages. So in each of the blocks, we have to make sure that for simulink to give the correct output, it has to be, there has to be some logic encoded which treats how you would respond to this message, regardless of which location you are in. And that's what we are doing. And then this transition is, is similar, right? So when you go out of ERP is when your timer expires and you reset your RRP. Very easy. And then in RRP, again, this self loop is for, you know, if, if there is no activation, then you just decrease your RRP counter, which is again consistent with our no notion. And then this is an interesting transition. If you are in RRP and you receive a secondary polarization, you have to go back to ERP. Remember how RRP can be interrupted. But to go back to ERP, we have to go through our temporary thing again for one clock cycle. 
So this is the last thing I wanted to discuss, but let me pause because I see again, maybe I have lost a few of you. And that may be only because you are not used to stage flow. But I at least wanted to take this opportunity to convince you that even though visually this looks like this is just completely something else, this is exactly the same as the node automata, which hopefully you have understood. Yes. You can, which is the same question as before. And you will, okay, let me give you the, the, the short version of the answer. One is that by decoupling things as their explicit transitions, um, it's easy to edit the model, but that's not a good enough reason. The other reason is that for the purposes of model checking using Simulink, this is a better format. And I know that will not make sense right now because we haven't looked at model checking. So maybe I didn't understand. What was your original question again? Oh, you, you, you mean to say that this could be a part of and? Or, 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 or actually. Yeah, so in all of this picture, there's no or. That's why it's separated. <laughs> okay, so it's a design choice. I know, I know it's, like I said, this is not the most efficient implementation, but what I want you to at least be with me is this is an equivalent implementation. And actually, you know, the assignment will not require you to change the automaton itself. We are giving you that as library elements. Mostly what you will do is connect things together or make decisions on how many of these you need. Any other questions? Is there a question there? So in the next lecture, I will also go over by the way, if you haven't used Symbolink, when you open something, it will usually not take this entire uh, screen real estate. So just hit space bar, okay? And it will fit to screen. It will save you a lot of frustration while working with uh, this tool. So in the next lecture, I'm going to first convince you that this is exactly the same as what we have discussed in the path automaton. In fact, this is easier than the, than the uh, node automaton. Uh, and then we will transition talking about transition systems into the uh, world of linear temporal logic, okay? Uh, so once again, this is due in a week and a half. Um, so you have time, but don't leave it as a last minute thing because it does require, I'll be upfront about it, this does require, you know, some, you have to sit down. And I'll also show you in the next lecture how uh, in Simulink uh, you could when you run the simulation, you could actually pause and add breakpoints. So you can actually analyze your model step by step to look at whether the transitions are happening in order or not. Okay, so this is all the hard work was up till this point so that you can play with this Simulink model. And uh, the idea is for this to be an interface for you to get comfortable with time automata. Because after visiting this detour of linear temporal logic, we will come back and we will model check this model. Okay, yeah. I'll see you in the next lecture.